What's up guys? Welcome back to our second week in this series on the prophets. Now last week, we kind of a wild story about Elisha and the floating axe head, right? If you remember, we talked about kind of recognizing our need for help from God, and then we need to figure out where we lost our edge in our faith to begin with. And then we also have to do our part in getting that edge back. Guys, I hope you were able to look at your walk this past week in your own time and kind of figure out where you can be more on fire for Jesus. I always want to be up front with you guys and let you know that um, I just don't give you these challenges and then ignore them throughout the week like I've arrived as the perfect Christian or anything like that. It's just simply not the case. So in the, the spirit of transparency, I wanted to share with you guys where I've dulled the edge of my walk a little and have made some changes this week. As a matter of fact, I use the Bible app for my daily reading. The time that I spend in lesson prep for these talks, it's not part of my personal study, right? So what I found was when I examined my life this past week that I had so many people um, that I was doing studies with or trying to do studies with that I wasn't doing any of them well, right? I was on a few days behind on some of the plans. I missed the start date on another plan and I wasn't really getting into the conversation like I needed to on a different plan. So how did I fix that? Well, guys, I left a lot of the invitations and I focused on just two reading plans with two groups in particular. I had like five open at one time and I wasn't doing any of them well. So I'm sure it looked spiritual, but then I realized, man, the axe head had flown off and like splashed down in the river, right? I wasn't getting anything done. And so I left a few of the plans and I explained to those guys why I left the plans and I focused just on these two instead. So maybe if you had time in small groups tonight, you can talk more about where you made changes this week to sharpen your walk. So in our time in the Bible tonight, we're actually going to look at another instance in the life of Elisha. Now, I know you, I hear you guys, right? We have, we've already looked at him as a prophet and there's lots of prophets, but guys, this story is one you just can't pass up when you're looking at strange stories in the Old Testament. So I'm also going to say up front that the way this story is often taught isn't exactly where we're going to um, stick with it tonight, right? We're not we're going to take away something a little bit different. If we do a very surface study of it, we're going to get a takeaway, which is okay, but when we dig just a tiny bit deeper under the surface, there is a much richer, much better explanation of why the story is in the Bible to begin with. So turn with me to 2 Kings 2 and let's read this passage in its entirety. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head! Go up, you bald head! And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord, and two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there, he returned to Samaria. Now, I bet you guys didn't see that coming, did you? Unless you knew where we were at in 2 Kings. Elisha had just witnessed his mentor, Elijah, taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. And then he was given the primary role as the prophet for God's people. And the moment that we just read happened as he was heading back from that location. And so without digging any deeper, I want to ask you guys, what lesson can we learn from that part of the story? Could it be don't make fun of a prophet or don't tease God's servants or be nice to old people, you know, whatever. I told you guys that when I grew up in my church my whole life, and this story, it didn't come up often, but when it did, it was always aimed at being nice to other people. Like if I said something mean to a kid in my class, I should be worried about hearing the bush bushes rustling on the playground and two bears coming after to chase me down. Now there's a great point in being kind to other people, but there are so many better and, and more developed examples of that challenge in Scripture. Jesus will be in a great example of having compassion on those who openly and even violently persecute you. It's not enough to be nice to those who are nice to you. Guys, we're called as Christians to be nice to those who are hateful to us. In Luke 6, 32, Jesus tells us this, If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. In verse 35, we read this, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Now, on the surface of this passage, guys, we have a call to be kind. Not that God is going to send bears after us if we're not nice to people, because it but because it demonstrates God's heart for other people. It makes us look more like Jesus when we're nice to other people. Um, but when we started, I told you there's a much richer, much more developed meaning to this story, and we dig just a little bit deeper. 
into the passage itself. So let's get past the surface stuff. Let's get to the really good stuff now. The first thing that we need to recognize is where Elisha was going. If you remember the passage that we read at the beginning, it told us that Elisha was going to Bethel. Now we recognize that city from a lot of events in scripture, but at the time of Elisha, Bethel was a horrible place. It was one of two cities known for their idol worship. A former king of Israel named Jeroboam had set up idol worship at Bethel as a political move, right? To keep the Jews from going back to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple. Uh, this was during this time kind of of the split kingdom, right? There was the north and the south. And this is the, the really wild part. Jeroboam had actually ordered a golden calf to be built at Bethel and set up this false sacrificial system there. It had nothing to do with God's system. And sadly, the people fell for it over and over again. My question for the people is, why did we fall for the whole golden calf thing all over again, right? Did you guys not remember how that worked out back in Exodus? But anyway, the prophet was heading into enemy territory here at 2 Kings, spiritually speaking. They were still Jews, but they had given up worshiping God in truth, and, and they were worshiping idols and this false religion that they had set up. So having a true prophet of God was a threat to their false worship. And a group of people started harassing Elisha. And that's where we get to our second point of, of, of digging deeper. Scripture says it's small boys, which sounds horrible when the bears attack what sounds like a bunch of third graders. But guys, a careful look into that word, it tells a little bit different story. The original Hebrew, man, there are three words that are used to make what we read little children in English. But as most words in the Hebrew language are, there is a range of meanings for a single word. The Hebrew word for little can actually mean small, it can mean in quantity, it can mean in size, number, age, status, or even importance. The two words that we use for children can be like a kid, it can also be anyone from birth to a young adulthood. In fact, the word is used to describe several people later in life, including Solomon after taking the throne from his father David, he wasn't a third grader when he took over the throne. He was, he was much older, in the life of David even. As he was on the run from Saul, that word was used to describe him and the mighty men that ran with him. These weren't little kids, right? They were full-grown men of war, and so there's a big range in the words that we read little children. When we read in English, it can still mean an insignificant group of grown men, which totally lines up with the idea of this group of guys that were protecting the profitable practice of false worship that was happening in Bethel. They saw the prophet as a threat, right? He was coming to put an end to this practice, and then they began harassing him in hopes of kind of shooing him away from Bethel and telling him to go somewhere else. But what application can we find in this deeper understanding of the passage from 2 Kings? Guys, we see that when we start to root out spiritual distractions in our lives, we are going to have some opposition, right? The enemy doesn't want us to see the hooks he's put in our lives and especially he doesn't want us to start pushing those things out of our lives in an effort to try to be more Christ-like. When we start taking our faith seriously and our walk seriously, guys, there are going to be people that are vocal about our changes. They're going to say we're being too religious or we're taking it too seriously or too far. Those are like those men that met Elisha on the road and they made fun of his bald spot. The taunts they're meant to distract us from the mission that God has put us on. We aren't going to tear down the idols in Bethel, but we are totally supposed to tear down the idols in our own lives. And when we do that, just like Elijah, he got fed up with the distraction from the mission and he called down a curse on these guys, right? God showed his favor on Elijah's mission by sending the bears to destroy that opposition. Some commentaries even mention that we never even find out the results of the attack, right? We don't know if any of the men died or they all survived, but one thing that they didn't do was get in the way of God's plan for Elijah. So as we keep learning from the lives of the prophets, guys, this week, we're going to keep looking at what mission God has us on, whatever it is in our lives, and we're going to expect opposition for that. But then we're going to trust in God to move that opposition out of the way for us when we surrender our plans to his plans. It might not be bears or some other zoo animal, but God is totally going to find a way in his perfect plan to remove the obstacles of his children that are on mission for him. So don't give up when you face opposition because you're pursuing his plan. Instead, of being, instead I want you to be steadfast and trust that he's going to see it through to completion. So guys, I look forward to some great small group discussions. We will see you all real soon.